So the title of the lesson, uh, the title of the message is Lessons from the Book of James. And I'll be reading from the, the New King James translation. And James, uh, we know, was the brother or half-brother of Jesus. And uh, he was not a believer when Jesus was walking the earth. He and his brothers and sisters, they were not believers. But after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, apparently they became believers. And James became the leader of the Jerusalem church. And it's titled uh, Lessons from the Book of James, and there are many very, very uh, profound lessons that we can learn from this uh, book. And uh, the first one is, is that we can profit from our trials. Now, nobody likes to go through trials, but James is going to tell us that we can profit from these trials, and sometimes these trials or uh, well, many times we have something to learn from these trials and something to benefit from these trials. And, uh, and some ways that we can profit from our trials is, one, it increases our faith as we're going to see. Imagine if uh, you never had a trial and you went through this life and everything was fine, everything was wonderful. You know, would you need God? Would you think about God? I mean, I, I would like to think that I would thank God every day for, for the wonderful blessings, you know, <laughs> to have a blessed life like that. But would most people, if they would never had a trial, would they be thinking about God? Would they be looking to God? Uh, no, no. Um, they wouldn't. So when we have trials, uh, one of the benefits of a trial is that it increase, increases our faith. Another way we profit from trials is that it produces patience, as we're going to see. Trials produce patience in us. And patience is a uh, fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering. Three, it helps us to become perfect and complete. Trials help us to become perfect and complete. Perfect meaning, also meaning, meaning complete or mature. And fourth, Trials enable us to console others. When we go through trials, then we are able to comfort others who go through the same trials because we have been through it. We, we can walk in their shoes and have, have empathy. We turn to uh, James 1 and verse 2, please. James 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Well, that's one word that doesn't belong with, uh, associated with trials, joy. certainly doesn't. Um, and of course, if you're not, uh, if you don't have God's Holy Spirit, uh, you, you really can't relate to this. And even with God's Holy Spirit, it's going to take a level of maturity to really relate to this, to have joy when you fall into various trials. Joy is the word 5479 from the concordance, and it means a cheerfulness, a calm delight. You go into a trial, you know, you're not panicking, you're not, you know, you're not saying, woe is me, you're not in despair, uh, because God gives you peace also, but he gives you this calm delight. Now, the delight part is because uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see what James how James and the, the Bible explains uh, that we can have this delight during trials. And uh, so a cheerfulness, a calm delight. And uh, if we go on, uh, no, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So, when we have these trials, we gotta we gotta look to God, and we have to have faith, uh, knowing that God loves us; He will never leave us or forsake us, and that whatever happens, it's God's will. But we have we have a joy because we know that uh, this life is temporary. This life is temporary. This is like this is like an illusion in a way. You know, it's temporary. The reality is the kingdom of God. And uh, so, you know, we cling to this life. Nobody wants to die, you know. You want to be in the game as long as, the game of life as long as possible. You don't want to, nobody wants to die. But, 
you know, if, if we're all going to die, we know that, we want to put it off as long as possible. But death isn't the end, and when we're believers, we know that. Death is not the end. Death is only the beginning of eternal life with Jesus Christ, God the Father, in the kingdom of God. So, it's all about faith, really. It's all about strengthening our faith. And trials can strengthen our faith, because when we have trials, we don't rely on ourselves. We can't rely on ourselves. We have to rely on God. We have to rely on God. And we have to uh, have patience, because we know that God acts on His timetable. He doesn't act on our timetable. Time and, you know, sometimes it's God's will not to heal someone, because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. So that person in the wheelchair who's praising God, and who's an example uh, of, of preaching the gospel, or that person who's blind, God chooses not to heal them, but chooses to allow them to remain in that condition as, as examples of God, uh, how God can work with uh, any individual in any affliction. I remember God didn't heal the Apostle Paul uh, when he had that affliction, and Paul prayed, and God said, No, um, my strength is made perfect in weakness, and uh, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. So, uh, so when we have a trial, it produces patience because, again, uh, we have to rely on God, and sometimes a trial can last uh, uh, for a long period of time. But God knows how much we can endure, and uh, and God will, God loves us, and He will intervene at, at uh, according to His will. And so trials also, as it says in verse four. Patience then leads to that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So having patience will strengthen our faith and make us perfect or complete. Perfect means complete also. It says complete here. Perfect or mature as we rely on God. As we rely on God. And uh, perfect also is the word uh, 5046. It also means uh, complete in growth, in spiritual growth, in mental and moral character. In mental and moral character. Uh, let's see uh, some other scriptures uh, that back up what James is saying. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. First Peter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So when we, when we believe this, that he is giving us this hope, that the resurrection of Christ is giving us this hope of eternal life, and to be in the kingdom of God, so then, you know, we, we don't have to cling to this life. We don't have to cling to this life. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So it, the power of God through faith helps us to continue in this walk and to, and to walk in the Spirit by faith, ready to, uh, through faith for salvation, which is ready to be re revealed in the last time. So the goal is salvation, and our faith will lead us to that salvation. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a while, while well, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuine genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So our faith has to be tested. Trials can increase our faith, but trials test our faith. And then, and then as a result, it increases our faith. It increases our faith. But it, it tests our faith. As, as gold is being uh, tested in the fire, and the, purity, the impurities are coming off, who, having not seen, 
Oh, Jesus Christ, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter is telling us here is that our faith has to be tested and strengthened uh, through trials. Uh, 2 Peter 2.9. 2 Peter 2.9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations or trials and to reserve the unjust on the punishment for the day of judgment. So God knows how to deliver the godly out of trials and out, and out of temptations too at times. When we go to God, we have a temptation and we know that that's wrong, sinful, and we go to God and God can give us the strength to resist that temptation. And he knows also how to deliver us out of trials. And sometimes the answer is death. Sometimes the answer to the end of a trial is death. But again, we always have to remember that this is this life is temporary. It's not the reality. The kingdom of God is the reality. So whether we so if we if we die, we don't have to uh, be uh, our loved ones don't have to, of course we're sad and we grieve, but our loved ones and we have the hope of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Um, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. You know, whatever you're going through, thousands of people are going through around the world, maybe, who knows, hundreds of thousands. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And that word temptation means trials. So he will not allow you to have a trial beyond what you are able, but with the trial will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And that a way of escape could be healing, could be death, it could be that job comes along at uh, that, uh, that crucial time, uh, it could be something that's going to uh, bring you out of that trial out of that trial after you perhaps um, profited from from it um, and James uh, 1 and verse 12 James 1 James 1 and verse 12 see we, we need to endure our trials we need to endure our trials Blessed is the man who endures temptation or trials. For when if he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then it talks about temptation. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. And enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So many times, sometimes our trials are caused by ourselves. We are tempted. We make the wrong choices. We sin, and uh, there's consequence of sin. And many times, uh, we, uh, God, will allow us to uh, enter these trials. Because we have something to learn and something to profit. And sometimes God corrects us too. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see that about that in a minute. Um, so, but we have to remember that God does not tempt anyone to do evil. Satan is the tempter. He's the tempter. He's the one that's going to tempt you uh, through, through, his cult, through the culture of this world. And you could read how he 
tempted uh, Christ in Matthew 4. He tried to uh, tempt Christ, and Christ came at him, came back at him with the Word of God, with the Word of God. If you, uh, James um, 1 and verse, oh, I read verse 14, okay. First uh, Peter 5 and verse 8. First Peter 5. It's the next book, First Peter 5 and verse 8. Peter says, be sober. That doesn't mean uh, not using alcohol. <laughs> it means to be aware, to be walking around with your eyes wide open. Uh, be sober, be vigilant, always watching. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he, he just doesn't want to scratch you or play with you or you know, scare you. He wants to devour you. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, so, you know, this world, Christ had promised this, this world was going to be, you know, perfect for us and we'd be unscathed. No, he said we're going to suffer. <laughs> We're going to suffer. He suffered. We're going to suffer. Not only persecution for the word of God, but we're going to suffer because we live in this dark, Satan-inspired world. And we don't fit in. Uh, we're lights. We're ambassadors for Christ. This is not our world. We don't fit into this world. And we're going to suffer. For, we're going to suffer like everybody else uh, suffers in this world. Um, but may the God of all grace who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So that's the goal of, uh, of uh, that's the result of trials that God wants to have. He wants to perfect you as you, after you go through the trial, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. And as I said before, sometimes we're chastened by the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 5. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Why would God do that? Why would he chasten us or allow us to go through a trial? Uh, Hebrews 12, and verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Quote, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Chastens means corrects. Uh, so, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons or daughters. For what son or daughter is there whom a father does not chasten or correct, but or punish, in a sense? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, or discipline, I should say, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful, for the present, but painful, nevertheless, after what it yields, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So God corrects us. He disciplines us. He allows us, he allows us to have uh, fall into these trials because he wants us to learn something from them or because we're going the wrong way and he wants to bring us back. So we see uh, the first point is that first lesson is that we can profit from our trials. We can profit from our trials. Next time you have a trial, read James and uh, you know, try to apply it. Try to apply it. Uh, because we have to have these things on our minds. We go through a trial and forget the message today, forget about the Bible and everything, and you know, you're not going to profit from your trial. But we have to be in tune with God when we're going through a trial and praying and uh, studying. 
Lesson two is that uh, we can have godly wisdom. We can have godly wisdom. And godly wisdom can limit our trials. Just think about it. If we have godly wisdom, uh, the consequence of that would be we'll, we'll probably have less trials, right? Because we'll be able to walk soberly. We'll be able to walk vigilantly. We'll be able to see, discern between what is right and wrong and what is good and evil. And uh, James, uh, James 1 and verse 5. James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So when we're asking for anything from God, or wisdom, we have to believe that he can give it to us. We can't go into the prayer thinking, oh, I don't know, if God is going to give me wisdom. Maybe he doesn't like me, or I just, uh, he's not going to do it, or I don't know if he can do it. You know? But we have to believe that God can and will give us wisdom. But all you have to do is ask. You have to ask in faith. You have to ask. So if you find yourself making bad decisions in life, uh, getting into trouble, getting into trials, uh, ask God for wisdom. Because uh, that could be the key uh, to, uh, to walking through life without going through many trials. And, and the key to making uh, better decisions. Because you'll be able to discern between right and wrong, good and evil. And uh, so wisdom is very important. Now, even with wisdom, you know, doesn't mean uh, you're going to always make the right decisions. Just look at Solomon, right? Solomon had wisdom, and he made a lot of mistakes. So, But but uh, the point is, is that, you know, we have free will. And even, you know, God can help us, you know, but... Ultimately, we're going to make the decision. So, but with God's wisdom, though, and uh, we can make the right decisions in life and avoid a lot of tr uh, trials. And uh, but we have to ask in faith. Uh, chapter three and verse thirteen. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. So, if you have bitter envy in you, if you have envy, and if you have, uh, if you are self-seeking, those are demonic. Uh, in the in, 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 uh, feelings. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above, that God gives us, is pure. The wisdom that God gives us is peaceable. It's gentle. It's, will it's willing to yield. Many times we get into trouble, we're not willing to yield. We're not willing to, we want to win the argument. We want to, we want to get our way. God's wisdom is full of mercy doesn't condemn people, forgives people. God's wisdom is full of good fruits. God's wisdom is without, without partiality and without hypocrisy. But the wisdom of this world, let's take a look at the wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 19. Let's God think about the, the wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians uh, 3 and verse 19. For well, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. People out there that think that they're wise, uh, they're trying to get ahead, uh, it's foolishness. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. So, the wisdom of this world 
is foolishness to God. It's foolishness. So we can only have true wisdom from God through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Proverbs 2, verse 6. Proverbs, the first few chapters of Proverbs have a lot to say about wisdom. Proverbs 2, verse 6. Proverbs 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. You are his saints. We are saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity in every good path. So wisdom will give us understanding of holy things, of, of righteous things. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Big part of wisdom is discretion. You don't go blabbing everything that people tell you. You don't be gossiping. You, you don't, people are prying into your life. You know, you, you be discreet about it. Um, Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you. To deliver you from the way of evil. From the man who speaks perverse things. Wisdom will help us to avoid people who are not good for us. And to avoid them. And to uh, stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. And so with God's wisdom is more difficult for Satan to tempt and deceive us. And uh, 1 Kings 3 and verse 9. 1 Kings, 1 Kings 3 and verse 9. You know the story of Solomon. When Solomon was a teenager, probably 17, 18, he became king. And God came to him in the dream and said, uh, uh, what can I give you? I ask for anything and I'll give it to you. And uh, verse 9, what did Solomon ask for? He said to God, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? And the, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had, had asked this thing. So God gave not only gave him wisdom, but gave him wealth, and gave him power. And uh, but the, the point here is that Solomon felt the most important thing God could give him was wisdom. Being a young king, being a young king. The third, the third lesson we can learn from uh, James is the book of James is that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, we are saved by faith and not works. But once, when I say saved, I mean uh, you accept Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, but then you're not saved until, until you know, until the end, you know, until you stay faithful to God and uh, develop Godly character. But you're not saved. By works, you're saved by faith. But once you're saved, meaning that you accept Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, you're a child of God, you do you do works. You obey God. You, you obey the commandments. You do the works of God. It's not the works that save you. It's, it's faith in Christ. And uh, if you go to Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, In verse 1, Hebrews 11. Hebrews is right before James. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And God gives us a definition of uh, faith. Now, faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the key to salvation. That is the key to every Christian's walk. Faith. 
And it's the substance of things hoped for. We hope for the kingdom of God. We can't see the kingdom of God. We hope to live forever with Jesus Christ. We can't see Jesus Christ. We don't, we don't, uh, when we die, is that really, are we really going, in the next waking moment, are we really going to be in the kingdom? Are we really going to see Jesus Christ? Well, we have to believe that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's what we hope for. It's the evidence of things not seen. We know there's going to be a millennium. We know that we're going to be in the kingdom of God. We know that we're going to live forever. We know that we're going to be the new Jerusalem. And uh, we're going to walk with God and Jesus Christ. We know those things. It's the evidence of things not seen. And that's our faith. The evidence of things not seen. And we can't let anybody shake our faith. Um, and... Uh, Verse 2, for by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. We believe that God created the earth, and God created man. Uh, James 1 and verse 22, James 1 and verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If, if, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. In what he does. So, we have to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Oh, there are plenty of people that talk a good talk. We just, we just, just go on TV and see the TV preachers. They talk a good talk. But are they living their lives? Are they living their lives? according to God's word. Are they walking the walk? So we have to be doers of the word. And that's where our faith comes in. And chapter 2 and verse 14. For what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? Remember, Jesus said to, the, to those who were seeming, seemingly doing works, doing miracles in his name, and, and then um, he said to them, uh, I never knew you. I never knew you. So people can say a lot of things in Jesus' name. It doesn't mean that they know Jesus Christ or that they are genuine Christians. They can talk a good talk, and sometimes maybe even... Uh, do something in Christ's name that might be, uh, you know, impressive. But they're not doing it in Christ's name. They're not doing it. Christ is not in them. Um, but remember, Satan has powers too. Satan has powers too. And remember, his ministers are like angels of light. So if his ministers are like angels of light, you know, they're going to be impressive people. And, uh, Satan could give his ministers the ability to do miracles or acts that will astonish people. Or so, but the point is, is that uh, going back to uh, chapter two, verse fourteen, and then he makes the point: if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, you know, you see somebody say, "Oh, I'll pray for you." <laughs> Depart in peace. Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Mm -hmm. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is death. Is, is dead. You know, you, you, I'll pray for you. I have faith that, you know, 
God will provide, <laughs> provide some food from some, somehow. <laughs> um, but that that faith is dead because you didn't do anything. You know, you you didn't you didn't have the works to back up your faith. But some will say, "You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works." You believe that there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe in tremble. So Satan and the demons, they believe in God. They have faith in God in the sense that they believe in God. They don't have faith in the sense that they uh, follow God. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect? And Abraham knew that uh, he had faith in God. He knew that God had provided Isaac as his only begotten son, and that Isaac was, God had promised Isaac, he made promises to Isaac. Now, he was told to kill Isaac. And Abraham had faith. He knew that even if he had plunged a knife into Isaac, that God was able to resurrect him from the dead, right? And, uh, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. This is the third time he says it. The third, the third scripture in this, uh, in this uh, short amount of scripture. It says it three times. Now we're always told when we hear something twice, God says something twice, we should pay a lot of attention to it. But here he said it three times. For as the body without the spirit is dead, and the body without the Holy Spirit is permanently dead, remember that, um, faith without works is dead also. And... Uh, Chapter 2. Okay, uh, we go to Luke uh, 6 and verse 46. Luke uh, 6. Luke 6. Luke 6 and verse 46. And Jesus says, uh, Why do you call me Lord? Lord, and, and you don't do the things which I say. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat, beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which, which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So we have that faith in Jesus Christ, and he is our rock, he is our foundation. And uh, we have to do the things that God tells us to do. We have to have faith and do what God tells us, because that demonstrates our faith. And... Uh, So God is love, and we must love our neighbor as ourselves, and that's that's uh, how we we generate good works. We through the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering of people, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faith, self control, or the fruit of the spirit, and that's in Galatians five and verse twenty two, and that, that's basically how. Uh, we were able to do good works. And uh, the most important, of course, is, is love. And uh, God's love. And God's love is not based on emotions. I don't have to feel like I love you. <laughs> Christ loved everybody, right? And so that's how that's God's love, agape love, uh, also called agapu. Uh, another word that's uh, used. And uh, basically, God's love is an unselfish love. It's a love based on uh, moral and social uh, outputs. It's based on morality and God's morality. It's based on 
uh, our duty to society, our duty to our fellow man, uh, to to have to be kind, to be good, to to uh, be empathetic, to have compassion for. Uh, that's God's love. That's God's love, and uh, to all people. And uh, Jesus didn't discriminate. He, he his love went out to everybody, and uh, and. Uh, that's also how we show our faith. The fourth lesson is that there's a member of our body that is untamable. It's a little member of our body. And we must use wisdom to limit its damage because if we let it just go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause problems. And that's our tongue. The tongue is untamable. And we, we must use wisdom to limit its damage. And then we must use our tongue to uplift others, to uplift others, not to put them down. We go to James chapter 3 and verse 2. James chapter 3 and verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, or complete, able also to bridle the whole body. So, we have to be careful about our words. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? Our tongue can set things on fire. It's the metaphor. And the tongue is a fire. A world of inequity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and it sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, with our tongue, we bless our, our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things are not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grape vine bear figs? Thus no spring yields forth salt and fresh water. Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to tame our tongue. And uh, the less speaking we do, the better. Because <laughs> the more we speak, the more, the more our opportunity to put our foot in our mouth. <laughs> and we have to be careful too, but many times we have to be very precise with our words. I always like to, when I'm saying something, I always like to think, uh, did I use the right words? Does that person understand what I'm saying? Can that person misinterpret what I'm saying? The many times people misinterpret what you say, then they're offended. But you didn't mean it that way. But you used a word or that they took it to be in a different way. So you got to be so careful when you're speaking to people. Uh, and, you know, uh, people can uh, hold grudges against you, uh, the things you say, they can, uh, they, can, they can be bitter. Of course, God tells us uh, if we're Christians that we're not to be that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we can get mad and say something to somebody that we regret. But, you know, once the word comes out, <laughs> you can't take it back again, right? You can't, can't take it back again. It's like time. Time goes on. You can't, you can't get back. But um, so you know, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me. Uh, not true. Not true. Um, 
But words can never harm me. I'm sorry. But words can never harm me. Not true. Uh, words can cripple people in a uh, in a figurative sense. Words can kill people. There are people who have committed suicide because of people's words. People can go through life uh, really feeling less of themselves because somebody told them something when they were young. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe a teacher or your father or mother. You'll never be good. You'll never be any good. You're lousy. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're no good. And uh, so words are very, are very powerful. So we have to limit the damage. <laughs> we have to try. God says the word, the, our tongue's untamable. So we've got to try to try to manage it the best we can. We've got to try to limit the, the damage. If you turn to uh, chapter 4 and verse 11, chapter 4 and verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Mm -hmm. So we are not to speak evil of one another and, and not to judge one another. The word, the word judging here means to condemn. We're not to condemn people. Uh, we're not to speak evil of people. And uh, that's one way that we can limit the damage, and uh, by not speaking evil of other people, and uh, not gossiping, not gossiping, not uh, spreading rumors. Um, chapter five and verse twelve. But above all, my brother, do not swear either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath. But let your yes be yes and you no no, lest you fall into judgment. So we're not to swear. If we're before a judge in a court, we say, I affirm. You know. But we're not to swear by heaven or earth, or by God. Uh, but, you know, if we say yes, we need to keep our word. If we say no, it's a no. Um, the thing is, it's important also to, if we do say yes, to keep our word. And to fulfill whatever commitment uh, we are we are given, but we're not to swear. We're not to swear. As God said, you know, we can't make a hair in our head grow. Or I tried. No, <laughs> no. Uh, no it, um, we can't make ourselves taller. You know, we can't. Uh, uh, we, you know, we, we. Uh, So God doesn't want us to, to swear. He wants us to just keep our words, just keep our words. And uh, chapter 5 and verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So we're not to grumble. We're not to grumble. Grumble meaning, you know, we're upset with somebody, so we're going we're gonna to go and tell somebody else how upset we are and what that person did. Uh, maybe it's a boss at work, or a co-worker, or a pastor, or somebody in the congregation. So we're not to grumble. We're not to grumble. The only person I grumble to is my wife. <laughs> the only person I gossip to is my wife. I gossip her to my wife, and it stays, <laughs> it stays there. You know, it stays there. It doesn't go, it doesn't go out. Um, so God is the judge. He's standing at the door. So we're not to grumble. Um, Chapter 1 and verse 26. Chapter 1 and verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, you know, we could talk a good talk sometimes, but some, many times, you know, what we're saying is not true. It's hypocritical. We don't really believe it. We just want to impress other people. If anybody uh, among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Mm -hmm. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, so that to serve people, to help people, orphans and widows and others. 
and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Unspotted means is that nobody in the world can say a bad thing about you because you're doing good works, because you're uh, an example of Jesus Christ. You're unspotted from the world. You're unspotted from the world. Nobody can say anything bad about you. You know, you set the right example. That's pure religion. In other words, how you conduct your life, not 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 necessarily what's coming out of your mouth. Um, and God says, if you want to be religious, bridle your tongue, <laughs> bridle your tongue, because um, many times, you know, we want to impress other people, and we say things to make us look to make us look better. You take us look more righteous, to make us look more religious. In Proverbs 18 and verse 13, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18 and verse 13. This is a fun topic. I like this topic. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. So, again, we have to control our tongue, our words. Listen, listen. We need to listen and then answer. We don't answer a matter before we hear it. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody and... Uh, I, you know, they start to talk, and I think I know exactly what they're going to say, and so I jump in, and uh, I say, no, that's not, what I, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, or, you know, you want to hear, you want to listen, you want to hear, and then you want to, so you'll be able to answer in an intelligent way. And uh, so, he who answers the matter before he hears it, it is, it is folly. In 1 Timothy 5, and verse 13, 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. And verse 13. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, to witness the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep his commandment without spot, blameless, Oh, that's six, I'm sorry. First Timothy 5, 13. And besides, now here, here Paul's talking about um, people who are idle. That's a time when you've got to be careful when you're idle. You have a lot of time on your hands, you know. Mm -hmm. You're not working, maybe, or you're busy, you're not busy, you have a lot of time on your hands, and you pull this one up, you pull that one up. <laughs> and, you know, oh, I know what I heard today in church, uh, what the person did on uh, Oh, how's so-and-so? What's... Uh, Oh, you know, that's okay to ask about somebody and see how they're doing, but, you know, so Paul say talking about uh, widows here, and particularly the young widows, mm -hmm. and besides, or singles, uh, singles, and besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, mm -hmm. and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. And so, again, we have to be careful uh, when, we're in, when we're idle, we have too much time on our hands. And, and uh, when, we do, when we are talking, we have to try not to gossip, but to use words to uplift, to encourage others. And James gives us actually a way that we can try to tame the tongue. He gives us a, a way. James uh, chapter 1 and verse 19. And here, here is uh, very spiritual advice and that we should take to heart. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So, if we try to apply that in our lives, we'd be better off. Listen. Be swift to hear. Somebody's talking, listen. Listen to what they're saying. Don't jump in. Don't uh, think you know what they're saying until you hear it. Because um, the less you talk, the better. Really. 
Because that's what you get in trouble. So you'd be swift to hear, slow to speak. Slow to speak. In other words, uh, you're going to choose your words carefully. And slow to wrath. So if somebody says something they think is offensive, you're slow to wrath. You get a clarification. Or, you know, you, you, uh, you say, okay, let's agree to disagree. And, uh, you know, you don't... You don't let anybody push your button. You shouldn't have a button to push. <laughs> um, so remember that. Uh, remember that. Be um, uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, and we'll be better off. The fifth, the fifth lesson in the book of James is to beware of partiality and personal favoritism. In the church, uh, James 2 and verse uh, 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. What does that mean? Well, discriminating against people because of the way they look or the way they talk. Or, For if they should come into your assembly, a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and they should also come one in a, in a poor man in filthy clothes. Mm -hmm. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, here, you sit here. You sit up front here. It is a nice seat here. Mm -hmm. And you say, uh, you stand here, or sit here at my foot. Oh, uh, what's that? And say to the poor man, you stand here, or sit here at my foot still. You know, you go, sit all the way back there, you know, where they can see you. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves mm -hmm. and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the whole of that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But... If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. But whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, he's guilty of all. So the lesson here is that we are not to be partial and have personal favoritism. I think we can we can expand that a little bit and that we shouldn't have cliques. You know, we shouldn't be coming to church and sitting next 